Well, this is uh, on the church calendar. We're nearing the end of the, uh, the, the Christian calendar year. We have two more Sundays. And uh, so we, we, we get to celebrate New Year early here. <laughs> In a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll start off the Christian calendar with Advent. The, the Christian calendar begins uh, with Advent leading up to Christmas, of course. So we're nearing the end of this year. This is uh, the year uh, C in the lectionary. The lectionary is three years, uh, a particular order to, to work your way through the scriptures. Uh, so we're in the third of those years uh, right now. Year C, we'll start over again in year A in a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll go from there. The text this week describes an encounter between Jesus and some Sadducees. There's lots of encounters between Jesus and Pharisees in the Gospels, not so many with Sadducees. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified. So for the last several weeks, these uh, messages we've been uh, discussing are all on Jesus' trek back to Jerusalem uh, to be crucified. So the Pharisees had been challenging Jesus quite often. Uh, Earlier in Luke 20, Jesus' authority was questioned by the chief priests and the scribes, and Jesus confounded them with his answers. They set uh, some spies out to trap him. They questioned him about paying taxes to Caesar, and Jesus kind of answered in a way that they uh, they couldn't resist, and uh, again, they went away without asking any more questions. Now the Sadducees take their turn at uh, asking Jesus some questions. We see through all of these, these challenges leveled against Jesus that the various uh, religious factions were in rivalry with one another. They weren't just in rivalry with Jesus, they were actually in rivalry, rivalry with one another. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the, the Samaritans, different groups uh, understood the scriptures differently. And they're all seeking to prove that their uh, way was right. Kind of like our denominations today. Right? <laughs> uh, they're all trying to get to, to, to discern if Jesus is on their side or not. If he, whose camp is he in? You know, we always like to pigeonhole people, and they were trying to do that. Uh, but Jesus uh, won't allow himself to be pigeonholed that way. He won't take sides. So first, let's talk about the Sadducees a little bit. Who, who were the Sadducees? Well, they were Jewish elites. They were very supportive of the priestly caste or the priestly uh, 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 people in the, in the temple and in the, in the synagogues. Some of them were members of the Sanhedrin, this Council of Seventy that passed judgment on religious things along with some Pharisees and others. Uh, they, uh, what's uh, kind of distinctive about the Sadducees is they only uh, uh, understood the first five books of the Bible, what we call the Torah, to be authoritative scripture. So the Pharisees accepted all of that. The, the, uh, these, the, the Sadducees did not. They, they looked at only the first five books as, as authoritative. And that'll come into play later in this story. They were literalists. They, they read the Bible literally. Uh, they didn't have much room for uh, nuance in the way they understood scripture. And they did not believe in resurrection. That's why they are sad, you see. You've heard that joke before. <laughs> uh, so even in Jesus' day, people were arguing about which text should be considered as authoritative, just like that same argument is going on today. The, the Sadducees seem to have disappeared at AD 70 when Rome was destroyed by the Romans. I mean, when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. The Sadducees ended then. They stayed in the city. They didn't heed Jesus' words to leave when they saw all these signs. They stayed behind, and they were destroyed, and all of their writings were destroyed. So really, all we know about the Sadducees comes from their opponents and what their opponents write about them, because like we've talked about before, the victors get to write the history. So even in the Gospels, we we hear the oppositional voices describing the Pharisees. So let's start at Luke uh, 20, verse 27. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. So keep in mind that these, these people don't believe in the resurrection. They say that, they say that they don't believe in the resurrection, the resurrection because there's no texts in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that speak of resurrection. So since they only hold those first five books as authoritative, they say, well, in our scriptures, we don't see anything about resurrection, so they didn't believe in that. So then they begin the question, teacher, Moses wrote for us, and remember Moses is considered to be the author of the first five books of the Bible. They're, all, they're called the books of Moses. Uh, 
because if you look closely, you'll see that the, the books of Moses describe Moses' death, which would have been hard for Moses to write about. So, <laughs> so there are scholars look at the first five books of the Bible a little differently and, don't, and, and say that they're more of a compilation, that there were other authors involved as well. But the tradition says, and actually the scripture says, these are the books of Moses. They're books about Moses, certainly, and uh, the other uh, uh, patriarchs that came before him. So Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. This, uh, this is called Leverite marriage, this idea that if, if an elder brother is married, he doesn't have any children, and he passes away, then the next younger brother is supposed to marry his, uh, his uh, sister-in-law and have children for his brother uh, or on behalf of his brother. It's kind of an informative and entertaining uh, passage. Uh, actually, in Deuteronomy 25, this whole Levite marriage thing is described, and also there's an example of it in Genesis 38. So let's look at, this is how Levite marriage worked. You see the skeleton there, that's representing uh, somebody who has died, who was married to the woman in the middle, and a man and a brother's widow. Uh, if the widow uh, has no children, she's, she's supposed to, what this describes, widow who had not born a son required to marry her brother-in-law and must submit sexually to her new husband. Let me read the Deuteronomy passage. When brothers reside together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her, taking her in marriage and performing the duty of a husband's brother to her, and the firstborn whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the deceased brother, so that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So it's kind of a curious thing. The, uh, the brother-in-law who marries the widow, if they have a son, the son takes the name of the deceased fa father who actually hadn't had them. So it, but it's a way in order to... Uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Now let's go from there. So you can understand this, this whole thing a couple of ways. It's a way to care for widows, which is a, a, a kind thing to do. In that, in that culture, if you'd lost your husband, you would have been in a hard, spell, hard spot to, protect, to uh, provide for yourself. But it also w functioned as a way to perpetuate the name and the lineage of the deceased brother. Uh, note this phrase here in their question, uh, raise up children for his brother. That's how they thought about this. Uh, in the Genesis story uh, about this, Judah had taken a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death, is what this story says. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to, to her, raise up offspring for your brother. So there's that phrase again. The idea was that if you died without children, that was the end of your you and your lineage because they didn't believe in resurrection. They, like that was the end. So they, they had this, this idea that if you can have children, then of a sort you could carry on. Your lineage would carry on and your kids would not, I mean, at least they would remember you. And they, you know, there would be a, some kind of perpetuation going into the future. So the Sadducees believed this. When you die, you're dead. <laughs> It's kind of simple. When you die, you're over. You're dead. That's what the Pharisees believed. And probably a lot of us believe that today. When you die, you're dead. Huh? Uh, so it's interesting then, if, when these Pharisees construct this scenario for Jesus. The Sadducees. Yes, thank you. Uh, starting at verse 29. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. So we, got, we have some Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection constructing a hypothetical scenario about resurrection uh, and marriage in the afterlife, which they didn't believe in. They didn't believe in any of this, but they construct this whole scenario. So we might call this a straw man argument. You know what straw man arguments are? You, you present to your opponent what you think they believe in order to 
uh, get a conversation going with them, but it's, it's based on how you perceive that your opponent believes. Often it's not correct. Often it's an oversimplification or it's, a, it's not a legitimate explanation of what your opponent believes. But that, you, can, you can understand that this question a little bit that way. They're not really curious about these things because they don't believe in a resurrection. They don't believe in an afterlife. But they want to get Jesus on record as to what he believes. So they construct this scenario about the resurrection and the afterlife. Their lack of belief in a resurrection or an afterlife would have created a certain level of fear in them about death. Like if you don't think there's anything after death, then life becomes pretty important, right? Because this is all there is. There's nothing after this. So I'm going to propose uh, that, the, that we think of this in that way, that these guys, this life, this earthly uh, existence is all they think there is to, to life makes clinging to life very important and creates a natural aversion to death. So the best they could do was to have children as if by proxy their children would carry on their legacy after their death. So Jesus begins his response with this. Jesus said to them, those who belong to, to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So, no marriage in the afterlife, and Jesus calls that, that age. He contrasts that age with those who belong to this age. So when we're thinking through this, he's talking about two different ages. Not just those of this age, but those who belong to this age, is what he says. Who are those, then, that belong to this age? I'm going to propose that they, the people that belong to this age are those who live in fear of death, who live without any hope for anything after death. Because Jesus is trying to teach us something else, something different in this, right? So he's contrasting that age and this age. And he says, some people in this age belong to this age, like they're rooted in it. And in this, that rootedness results in an aversion, a fear of death. And if you have a fear of death, fear of dying, that will affect how you live your life. Because you'll live your life in ways to avoid dying, right? Because if you don't want to die, if that's the end, you're going to make certain decisions about your life here that will, in your view, reduce the opportunity for you to die. So I'm going to propose that those who live in fear of death are those that belong to this age, is what Jesus is saying. Like the Sadducees, those kind of people think when you die, you're dead. Jesus goes on and says, Indeed, they cannot die anymore, because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. So Jesus describes those who have died as being like angels, children of God, and children of the resurrection. These are the people of that age. Remember, this age is, is the people that are worried about dying. That age, he calls children of the resurrection. They have no fear of death because they cannot die anymore, he says. That's a funny phrase. Can't die anymore. <laughs> it's like, I can't lose weight anymore. I can't die anymore. Right? <laughs> so these are not people who don't exist. These are people who most definitely exist but live with no fear of death after death, right? Jesus calls them the children of the resurrection. And these people are very different from those people who belong to this age, those who live in fear of death. But here's my question. Must we, must we today wait until we die to begin living as children of the resurrection? Do we have to live like Sadducees, in other words? Do we have to live as if when we die, that's it. We don't have to live that way. Must we live our lives in fear of death only to have our fears calmed after we die? <laughs> is the question. It might mean a few things. It might mean that we don't have to worry about marrying, marrying and having children because we don't fear a lack of future existence. One thing I think the evangelical church has been uh, you know, wrong in is putting such a heavy overt emphasis on getting married and having children. I mean, Paul and Jesus certainly didn't put that emphasis on that. Uh, 
So we have several single people here, and I say, God bless you. You know, and uh, if, if you want to be married, then, then, then get married. But if it's working for you, then you can, you can, you're acting more like Jesus than a lot of us <laughs> and, <laughs> and Paul. So I, I think that the guilt trip that a lot of the evangelical church puts on uh, single people is not appropriate. And it's not even scriptural, even though they claim to be very, quote, biblical in their teachings. A lot of it, I think, is over the top. So... It might mean that we don't have to marry because we don't have to worry about a lack of existence after we die. It might mean that we live without fear of people taking our lives. Certainly not being reckless, just to be reckless, uh, but being willing, like Jesus, to lay our lives down for others. It might mean that we release our death grip on what we believe are our rights. <laughs> We're so consumed by rights in the United States, you know. I handed out a thing a couple of years ago about the, right, the rights that we Christians have, and it was two pages, I think, and they were not the rights that we talk about in our, you know, we have the right to lay our lives down. We have the right to, to follow Jesus. We have the right to turn the other cheek. We have all kinds of rights that, that don't sound like rights to uh, modern Americans. It might mean that we become more generous with our time, with our talent, and with our treasure. If we're not fearing death, it might mean it could open up our, our generosity more. Many Christians, however, live more like Sadducees than like children of the resurrection, clinging to our lives as if this is all we have. Then Jesus uses this example from Moses. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. So this is interesting. Jesus now grabs a, uh, a story from Exodus, which is in the Torah, in the first five books that the Sadducees uh, are, uh, accept. So he goes to their own scriptures to teach them about the resurrection. And even though this doesn't use the word resurrection, it says, Moses, we have to get, let me get in the timeline, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived before Moses. So Moses is writing about dead people. And when Moses writes about dead people, he says, now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. That's pretty amazing. To him, God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive when Moses wrote about them, and they were dead. So to God, they weren't dead. They were alive. Following? If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive, even though they had died, then what do we have to fear? Now, James Allison writes about this in his book, Raising Abel. He says, this quality which God always is, is that of being completely and entirely alive, living without any reference to death. There is no death in God. God has nothing to do with death. And for that reason, facts which are obvious to us, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob having been long dead at the time of Moses, simply do not exist for God. Let's put it another way. For us, being alive means not being dead. It's a reality which is circumscribed by its opposite. For God, this is simply not the case. For God, being alive has nothing to do with death and cannot even be contrasted with death. See, God can't die. So he d doesn't define himself with, in relationship to death at all. And he's saying we should think about our lives that way too. Following? We define ourselves as either dead or alive. God is not defined in any way by death. God is life, and for God, being alive has nothing to do with death and cannot even be contrasted with death. So, by God raising Jesus from the dead, which Paul calls a first fruit of all creation being raised from the dead, God was doing nothing less than recreating and redefining life for us humans. If Jesus was the first fruit of our resurrection from the dead, then we can define our lives apart from death, just like God does.
In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul writes this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. That last verse completely separates our def- definition of life from death. Right? All, as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Paul is saying, yes, you used to define your life in opposition to your death, but now that Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's the first fruits of our resurrection, we no longer need to define our, our lives in, in contrast to our deaths. In, resurrection, in the resurrection of the Son of Man, God defined life apart from death. He pulled life and death apart in the resurrection of Jesus with no reference to death and no fear of death. This is what Jesus, I think, I think what Jesus meant when he answered the Sadducees saying, now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them, or all of us, are alive. Uh, Allison writes in another one of his books, Jesus is a Forgiving Bi- a Victim. Jesus in reply gives as an example of the scriptures and the power of God, the story of Moses and the bush from the book of Exodus, where God says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jesus' point is that for God who knows not death, those people, long dead in terms of the supposed historical chronology of Moses' life, were alive. If they were alive to God, contaminated, as it were, with God's utter aliveness, held in presence by one whose presence is beyond time, then they are alive. It's God's aliveness that counts in understanding all these things. It's not our death fear and our death anxiety that defines life. It's God's utter and complete aliveness that defines life for us. Remember, though, what the Sadducees believed? When you die, you're dead. That's, they, come, they came to Jesus with this mindset. When you die, you're dead. In Jesus' response to that, Jesus, in essence, says, there is no death in God. Paul Nectarline writes about this too. Our human experience of death is so distorted that we completely misunderstand who God is, thinking that God somehow has a role in death when God is completely a God of life. We call him the Grim Reaper. (laughs) That's not God that's doing the reaping there. The resurrection starts us on the road of being able to finally catch a glimpse of these truths. At the same time as it shows us our cultural experience of death, it shows us that there is also a birth to new life through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. See, it's Jesus' forgiveness that opens this whole door to us, that opens eternal life to us. Then he says, we could never admit our enslavement to death if we were not already forgiven it. It, Like it's the forgiveness of Jesus, it's the forgiveness that Jesus spoke to us on the cross that makes us even capable to comprehend what we're talking about this morning. Without that forgiveness and without the cross, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be having this discussion this morning because it would be beyond our capacity to conceive of it. But that's the power of resurrection. It not only is, a, is the resurrection of our stinking bodies, it's the resurrection of our minds. Now, here and now, not, not after we, we are raised from the dead, but even now. So Paul speaks of this often as being in Christ. When he talks about being in Christ, this is what he's talking about. Now that, we, that Christ has opened this door through forgiveness to us and through the power of his resurrection as a first fruit, demonstrating that death is not the end for us, Paul speaks of that, that whole thing in a nutshell as being in Christ. Let me just read a few of the things he says about being in Christ. Romans 6.3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we've all, baptism takes us, it's not just a symbolic thing that we do, it takes us into the body of Christ in his death. What did he do in his death? He defeated death in his death, (laughs) right? And we're there with him in that. Then in Romans 6, 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, 
we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. The Orthodox say it this way, Christ defeated death by death. Death took a body. They thought he was just another human. Surprise, God was in that body. <laughs> and God cannot die. So when God goes into death and gains access to death, that way, in the body of Jesus, it blows death up. It does away with that. So now, what was apparent to God, even before Christ's death, that all those old saints are still alive, becomes apparent to us. Christ defeated death by death. Now we are baptized into that victorious death and are united with Christ in resurrection life. We are no longer defined by death, only by resurrection life. Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's another way to say this, hold our conversation. We've been set free from the Sadduceical uh, concept of our lives ending at death. Right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. <laughs> Yeah, there's more new than I used to realize there's new. <laughs> there's more passed away than I used to realize there was passed away. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. He was reconciling us to him, not him to us. We had the problem with God. He didn't have the problem with us, right? He was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. See, that our trespasses were not the problem for God. Our trespasses were the problem for us, right? And entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Okay, the last two verses, then some of the scribes answered. These are Sadducees, scribes. Teacher, you have spoken well. <laughs> I, I don't think that's ironic. I think they recognized, hey, he's gone back into Exodus and in one of the, in the scriptures that we hold as authoritative and showed us that there is life after death without the word resurrection, without using that word, he's used their own scriptures to show them, hey, Moses, the one that you uh, admonish and, and hold up high, already told you this. You've spoken well. And they no longer dared to ask him another question. So that was a big enough revelation for one day, I think is what that's saying. <laughs> Let us chew on that for a little bit. <laughs> so Jesus had used a story from their own scriptures to teach them about resurrection the fear of death, and the nature of the afterlife, which they didn't think any of that was in there. He, one of the things that I really like about this story is Jesus didn't belittle them for their, little, their limited understanding of God. He didn't talk down to them. He didn't belittle them. He just showed them in their own scriptures something they'd missed. He met them right where they were and opened their eyes to the God of life, not the God of death, the God who holds all people alive in his embrace. I mean, if he held Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in his embrace, he was holding everybody else in his embrace. And remember, this is prior to when Jesus went to the grave and led captivity captive out of the grave. He's showing that even prior to that, God in the scriptures spoke of all those people as being alive, not as being dead. So in God's from God's perspective, there is no death. This is something I think the annihilationists have to reckon with. That, and I, I recognize that the way they do it is to say that life is a gift from God, that God sustains our lives. And I, I'm in full agreement with that. I just disagree that he's going to stop sustaining the lives of those he loves. I think he'll, he'll keep reaching out to us and keep chasing after us until eventually uh, he'll, he'll give us every chance to, uh, to reciprocate. So. But, so even though the scribes and the Sadducees gave up on questions, we can still ask questions today. <laughs> so here's a few just to get us going. Does Jesus give this answer just as info information about the afterlife? Like usually when I've read this passage or heard people talk about it, the, the point anybody is trying to make is, well, there's no marriage in heaven. That's about as deep as anybody I've heard talk about this, is that, well, there's no marriage in heaven which really wasn't the, that was the hypothetical scenario that Jesus, you know, he was answering with that. So, he, yeah, that's true. 
but there's a heck of a lot more going on here than that, I think. Or is this passage more about how we are to understand death and life from God's perspective? That's one way to, to ask this. Another one, if we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, like Paul says, and he's not talking to dead people then, he's, talking, he's writing that to people who are alive. Shouldn't we start thinking about life and death from God's perspective? If Paul says we're seated there, shouldn't we start thinking about our lives and our deaths that way? Uh, what is eternal life anyway? In John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. In other words, eternal life is not about real estate, it's about relationship. It's not about a place, it's about a person. It's not about a, a cabin in the corner of glory, it's about an audience with Jesus. You know, it's a this is uh, you know, a shift that I think we, we need to make. Eternal life is not a place, it's a person. 